Now, with your permission, I'd like to say a couple of summary words. I'm not going to give you a long lecture. We're all pretty tired, I would assume. Look, I... Karl Popper was a philosopher of science and worked in the first half of the uh, 20th century. The philosophy of science, as he stated, is something that we all believe in today, meaning that there is a gathering, an assembly of information and effects in biology, in math, in chemistry, physica, physics, literature. I mean, we're gathering facts. And then we try to create or to invent or to uh, state theories that are laws. And these laws have to be, have two qualities. One, that the law has to be able to explain the entire uh, list of phenomena within its range or category. And two, it has to be, in principle, something that can be uh, refuted, meaning if you're creating a law that an, its axiom, then it's not interesting. Now, we work in science according to this philosophy and have done so for decades. This is fascinating to track uh, researchers around the world that came before us and see how Newton uh, did exactly this without knowing this philosophy and be able to recite it. Newton and Dalton in chemistry and uh, various uh, botanists, zoologists, natural sciences, scientists and other, uh, and other humanities and, uh, and social science experts. So what can we say about Humboldt? He lived in a period, I mean, this is fascinating. He lived in a period of time in which science was in its infancy, meaning really, I'll give you Newton's example. Newton, uh, Newton lived and was born in a century in which there were three big scientists, Galileo, Galilei, Kepler, and Newton. G Galileo was the first, of course, that it, well, he didn't invent the telescope, but used it. And there are many others in his time throughout Europe that uh, did lots of astronomical uh, sightings and tried to track the planets around the sun. Kepler, that uh, is younger than Galileo, uh, 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 knew all of these observations and articulated in his genius three laws, three rules. Notice that Kepler, that was not a mathematician, not a physicist actually, not really, uh, formulated three rules without understanding why these rules exist without explanation. But they meet my two rules in modernity, meaning Kepler explains very precisely everything that observations that have been done prior uh, uh, had supported. Now, the first law of Kepler says that a planet work, uh, orbits the sun in a trajectory that is elliptical. Elliptical, yes, not a circle, not a triangle, an elliptical uh, route, not a parabola, an ellipse. And this ellipse is such that the sun is one in one center. There are two uh, points of axis, the first point. And so the first point, planets orbit the sun according to an elliptical route. And then Newton came along and Newton understood Kepler's rules and added to them the mathematics that explained why uh, the planet cannot move in any other orbit apart from an elliptical one and why the sun must be in one of its two positions, meaning he added to Kepler's understanding uh, gathered to, uh, which is added, of course, to Galileo Galilei's observations and all of the people who came before Galileo Galilei. And Newton added the last step, the flourish, and added the mathematics, the explanation. This is in a great way to show the development, how the philosophy of physics in this case developed without any one of these people coordinating and all of them meeting Karl Popper's many years, centuries later uh, view. Another remark, the Newton laws that we all studied in school 
in middle school held for 300 years until the first of the, the beginning of the 20th century and then suddenly people Horbert and Mickelson noticed they did an experiment and they tried to challenge and challenging rules is part of scientific work we're trying to find things in order to refute them we're establishing things in order to overturn them so the rule as we know as we mentioned the proper rule is that all laws must be refutable and so we're constantly looking for new findings and data in order to refute our laws and when we finally find one it's very rare it's phenomena that are not explained by these rules only then can theoreticians coming back into the fold and that's what Einstein did with relativity when Morney and Michelson and others tried to refute uh, Newton's uh, uh, results Newton lived from the middle of the 18th century until the beginning middle of the 19th century until the beginning of the 19th century he didn't know the philosophy of uh, science uh, but uh, he himself it's amazing gathered so many findings himself he had a phenomenal memory he read all the time and as a result in his mind there was a whole list of uh, uh, data that was probably not known to most humans throughout its inception and gathered all of this information to do experiments not all of them successful uh, parenthetically Newton by the way formulated his rules and apparently they're not very good because then we have the laws of relativity and Einstein uh, took you know three of his rules and broke them there are three amazing laws and electromagnetical for 300 years we all based ourselves on Newton and then we discovered a couple of contradictions we saw the the theory of relativity the real to re the theory of relativity does explain these certain phenomena and this certain scale and certainly understands the concept of the speed of light choose why and and as long as we remain within human balance Newton's laws apply but we can see how these theories renew it's very clear but we have to look at each one of the researchers throughout history through the lens of their time and in that sense Humboldt is a fascinating figure he did several experiments to create laws and he did create laws in all sorts of fields so let me summarize by saying and giving you just uh, three examples of the how uh, he viewed things with such a rich perspective things that were I mean how he connected the dots were absolutely astonishing and I took one field he dealt with a lot and I try to sift I personally am interested in uh, calendars particularly the Hebrew calendars which is a, an amazing mathematical invention by the way for those who are unfamiliar with the methods behind the uh, Jewish uh, calendar it's based on the Sun uh, meaning 365 days a year divided into four uh, segments meaning the quarters of the year it's 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 solar but it's also a lunar calendar because according to the Torah according to Jewish law we have certain things that must be lunar and we know that this is a balance but the 12 months of the of the month of the moon are not one year of the Sun we know that there's the 10 days 11 days that are lacking and as a result if you counted the years according to months where the month is lost uh, 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 and there are 12 months in a year then our calendar would change over the years as is ha has happens to the Muslims so our ancestors in the time of the Second Temple managed to create mathematical laws for determining the Jewish calendar which are brilliant they're genius that for thousands of years they have been held and maintained and the difference between the leap years and non leap years and the difference between the lunar math and the solar math means that the Jewish calendar can be both lunar and so and uh, and uh, and solar with very few deviations now what did Humboldt know to say about this well among other things when he visited in South America and he was in the territory which is now called Colombia there's Colombia there's a ridge called of the of the Andes and east of it there's another ridge which in Bogota uh, and Bogota is on this ridge the city the capital city and west of that a little bit uh, lived about in the 12th 13th century there was a tribe and the tribe called was called Wisca and the Mawisca tribe it was fascinating to Humboldt and apparently the Muisca tribe needed 
because of its various mythologies and beliefs, they needed a solar year, but they also needed lunar months. And so they made efforts to create a calendar in order to create this hybrid uh, calendar, like the Jews. Something that this is something that fascinated Humboldt. Now I'm not going to give you this my lecture on the calendar, but I will give you three or four quotes from what I read in Humboldt's studies about this calendar because he came to South America, he met a priest called Dukin, and this uh, priest. Uh, uh, could spoke to the Indians, some of them could remember all sorts of things from the history of their answers as, as just hundreds of years earlier about the constructions and the theories regarding to the, their calendar. And I just want to give you three quotes that give us an image of what was interesting to Humboldt when he came to his conclusions and he managed to come up with the, the Muisca tribe calendar uh, they're, uh, they're mistaken, by the way, his uh, conclusions, but that's another matter altogether. For example, among other things, summarized, he, he summarized, he didn't re is discover this, the counting method of this tribe, particularly how they write their numerals and how the names that they give to the numerals and so forth. And he called these markings, they look very complicated. Humboldt called them hieroglyphs because they seemed so like the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And he really asked, are these hieroglyphs, these markers, do, are they reminiscent of the significance of the names of numbers in their language, in the Muisca language, or of the, I mean, what's the connection between their shape, their morphology, and the actual number they represent? And among other things, uh, Humboldt says that he didn't see a lot of similarity, but if you really try you can see it but he explained it thus this is the C is the richness of his thought who today would know in the form of the Hebrew letters and the Sumerian letters the the animals the homes and the weaponry that were apparently the inspiration for these forms amazing for those of you who read and are interested in the shapes of Hebrew letters, the morphology of the Hebrew language, of Hebrew script, uh, uh, you will understand that this was something that formulated uh, towards the end of the first temple period. We know we write the letter Kuf in Hebrew, for example, with uh, 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 two lines, and this is a disruption. It used to be written with a small circle and a line that comes down. And why was that the Kuf? because they took the letter kuf from a noun that I knew very well, kof hamachat. Kof hamachat. Kof hamachat is the hole of the needle, meaning the little hole through which you thread the thread. And that's why it looked like the letter kuf. The letter kaf in Hebrew, conversely, for example, you can see, and if you look a bit, we can see that the letter kaf in Hebrew looks very much like a hand and that is the first letter of the Hebrew word for hand the word letter Aleph and so forth and first of all he knew Hebrew script and he knew Sumerian script and he adds to that and here's the quote for the Tibetan script and Hindi script which are now called Arabic script by mistake, they also, of course, have significance, their morphology, and he, by the way, investigated this morphology, and in another place he writes, uh, when he came to speak about the cyclicality of the counting method of the Muisca tribe, he said that their counting method was in cycles of 20. So it was based on cycles actually of five and the Muisca in their language, in their ancient language, six, five was a hand, of course, five fingers, and six was a hand and more. It was to signify more. And 11 was hands and more, meaning two hands and more. Anything more than that. 20 was a human. It was a figure of a human to depict it in their script, meaning a human has five fingers and five toes on two limbs each, 20 digits. Now for this, Humboldt says, and this is interesting, for the Muisca tribe didn't adopt the Chinese or Greek script. 
They didn't take half or the half decades of the Mexicans, the Inca, or the ninth of the Peruvians, or the eighths of the Romans, or the weeks of the Jews. Shavuos, he writes in Hebrew, like, he writes in German, but it's a Hebrew word for week that can be found, meaning he didn't go to all of these things, that it also can be found in India and in Egypt, but not for the Persians or the Japanese. Now notice this remark, Humboldt is talking about scripts, numer numerals in script, but he's telling us an entire history, very his broad knowledge of how scripts are written around the world. The week of the Mawiska, he was, it was three days, 10 weeks was a moon in their language, a suna, suna is very important in their language, which is very, that's the significance, meaning a pathway. Why a pathway to call a month? Why is that called a path, a major path? Because the moon, because at the end of the month, the Muisca would uh, do a, would do a human sacrifice that would be that and they would take a route a major pathway and then they would be murdered horrifically and cruelly by being uh, 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 having shot arrows at them until they died but that was the route the path and that would happen every month and that's why it was called the pathway so the Muisca this tribe called their months they gave them numbers they didn't give them names we give our uh, months names. <laughs> Humboldt says that uh, name numbers instead of names for months are the most ancient ritual, uh, the most ancient custom in uh, Asia, as had been among the Jews until their exile to Babel. So when we read the the, the Bible, we we don't have names, that's right. We, it, we say the seventh month, the eighth month, the ninth month, and so forth. So, so I gave you these quotes in order to show that for me it's fascinating to read Humboldt, to understand how Humboldt was really on the precipice of modern science even before modern science existed to understand how he really knew all of the common knowledge of the general knowledge relevant to uh, uh, human advancement at the time. He was so, so knowledgeable. We heard about this and how still uh, for his time, for his period, he could and should be considered a, a leading uh, researcher and scientist. And we will meet next year.